Hi there, future teacher, and welcome to this multi-subject Teachers of Childhood Mathematics Practice Test. This video lesson is proudly presented by TeacherPreps.com, the number one choice for test prep to pass your teacher certification exam. This multi-subject Teachers of Childhood assessment evaluates your professional knowledge as a prospective elementary education teacher. And in this video, I'll present you with the types of math practice questions that you will likely see on test day. Now, in order to help you get totally prepared, this practice test will guide you through the types of questions you can expect to see on test day. If, however, you're feeling overwhelmed about preparing for this important exam, give yourself the all-access test prep that includes everything you need to pass your teacher certification exam with ease, including video lessons for busy students that's gonna help you study faster. Study guides written in a non-fluff, bullet point style. And best of all, timed practice tests that simulate what you'll receive on exam day. Visit teacherpreps.com now Click the blue button in the top right corner labeled Get Test Prep Now to give yourself everything you need to pass in one place so you can ace your upcoming teacher certification exam. Without further ado, let's begin. I'm going to read the question. I would highly recommend that you grab a pad and pen and work the problem out. Pause the video after I read the question and then I will explain how I came up with the answer, how you can find the correct answer in case some of these questions use different topics that you haven't been tested upon for a while. All right, let's begin. 15 out of 20 kids in a condominium enjoy playing chess. This is the same as what percentage of kids likes to play chess? Pause the video here. Try to find the answer and come back so that we can talk about it. All right, now let's work through this. Remember that 15 out of 20 means 15 over 20. To express this ratio or fraction as a percentage, you can multiply the ratio by 100 and then convert the entire fraction into its simplest form, which would give us 1,500 or 1,500 over 20. And this would give us the answer of 75%. Notice how in these explanations, I will walk us through the high level of finding the correct solution. However, it will be mathematics such as long division, like 1500 divided by 20, that the expectation is that if you are taking this exam, you remember how to do the basic or math. So we've got 75%. Let's keep going to the next question. A solution contains four parts of solute for each, for every seven parts of solvent. What amount of water should be mixed with 20 milliliters of solute to form the solution. Pause the video, see if you can find the answer, and let's go over it together. To find the amount of water or solvent that should be mixed with the solute to form the solution, with the given ratio, we can set up a portion based on the given information. So in this case, if it's been a while since you have looked at some of these math and science terms, remember that the solute is the substance that is dissolved in a solution, and the solvent is the substance that dissolves the solute to form a solution. So to find the amount of water, the solvent, that should be mixed with the solute to form the solution with the given ratio, we can use this proportion. All right, so now let's have a look at this. First and foremost, we need to be clear about the problem at hand. And every time that you have a problem on your teacher certification exam, make sure that you are clear about what it is that you need to do. So here we have the amount of solute, which is given as S equals 20. And therefore we have S equals 20 milliliters. Furthermore, the amount of solvent, water in this case, as we'll say is W. Now, according to the problem, the ratio of solute to solvent is four to seven. Therefore, for every four parts of solute, there should be seven parts of solvent. Next, we can write this relationship as the following, four over seven. Now, let's simply put the 20 in for S, which was already given to us in the problem, 
and we have our updated numbers. And what we want to do next is cross multiply to solve for w, where we can see that we will take 20 times 7 equals 4 times w. This gives us 140 equals 4w, and then we can divide this out. 140 divided by 4 is 35, so our answer is 35 milliliters. Moving on, during the sale period, stationary stores offer certain discounts as mentioned below. How much does the customer have to pay for a pair of brushes, three painting canvases, and one calligraphy pen? Take a look at the table down below, pause the video, try and work this problem out, and push play when you're ready to talk about it. All right, to solve this, we first need to understand the problem and what is being asked of us and for us. So we have three different types of stationary items, each with a specific discount during the sale. The customer buys a pair of painting brushes, three painting canvases, one calligraphy pen. Notice here how step number one is always going to be to understand what's being asked of us. On your teacher certification exam, read the problem and then summarize it in your own head to make sure that you understand and wrap your mind and your brain around what you need to do. So next, what we need to do is list the original prices and discounts for each item. Painting brush, 350, 10% discount. Going to the next item, that's the painting canvas, originally $29.30 each with a 20% discount. Calligraphy pen, $12.49 each, 15% discount. So notice here how we just clearly, simply lay out the information. And then step number three is to calculate the discounted price for each item. So we have the painting brush, the original price is $350, discount of 10%, 35 cents. So that means the discounted price is going to be $3.15. Next, we'll do the same thing with the painting canvas. We'll find the discounted price to be $23.44. Same thing with the calligraphy pen, where we will calculate the discounted price, which comes out to be $10.62. Finally, we need to add up these costs. $6.30 plus $70.32 plus $10.62 is going to give us a sum or a total of $87.24. Is that what you got? All right, great. Let's move on. Furniture takes up seven-eighths of a room's overall area. The wardrobe alone takes up two-thirds of this covered area. What fraction of the space is taken up by the wardrobe? Take a moment here. Work the problem out. Come back when you're ready to have a math talk about it. Now, when taking your exam, always be sure to start by understanding the problem. Here, we are given that furniture occupies seven-eighths of the total area of the room, and out of this area covered by furniture, the wardrobe alone occupies two-thirds. Therefore, we need to find what fraction of the total room's area is occupied by the wardrobe. Now that we understand the problem, we're going to move to step number two, which is to express the problem with fractions. Total area of the room is one for one whole room. Area occupied by the furniture is seven-eighths of the room, and the area of the furniture occupied by the wardrobe is two-thirds of the furniture's area. So next, we'll want to find the fraction of the total room occupied by the wardrobe by multiplying the fraction of the room that is occupied by furniture by the fraction of the furniture that is occupied by the wardrobe. So Next, let's multiply the numerators together and the denominators together, and we can see that we are left with the answer of 14 over 24. Moving on, next problem reads, solve the equation given below for the value of x. Again, take a moment here, pause the video, and come back so we can talk about it. All right. Great, let's discuss this problem. On exam day, always make sure to write the problem down first. To make the equation easier to work with, we'll clear the fractions by multiplying every term by the least common multiple of the denominators, in this case, 15, 3, 
and 5, which the LCM is 15. The next step is to expand both sides. So you can see that on the screen now. Now let's simplify the equation. We have 4x minus 5 equals 27. Furthermore, we're going to want to isolate the x by performing a basic operation. We are going to add 5 to both sides to get rid of the negative 5 on the left side. And then we want to divide both sides by 4 to solve for x. And that gives us an answer of x equals 8. All right, well done. Let's keep going to the next problem. Which of the following sets of ordered pairs describes a function? Take a moment here, pause the video, come back when you're ready. All right, let's talk about this. First and foremost, let's recall that a function is a relation between a set of inputs and a set of outputs where each input is related to exactly one output. This means no input or x value in a function can map to more than one output, or y value. Now, in order to actually solve this, we'll want to analyze each step of ordered pairs. Starting with option A, we see the pair of negative 3 and 5, negative 1, 7, negative 2, 5, negative 1, 3. Look for repeated x values and check their corresponding y values. The x value, negative 1, appears two times, or twice, and maps to two different y values, the 7 and the 3. Understanding this, we can see that option A is not a function, because an input maps to more than one output. Let's move on to option B. We have negative 2, 6, 1, 4, 3, 6, 4, 16. No x value is repeated, so we understand that option B is a function because each input has exactly one output. Now, on your teacher certification exam, if time allows, I personally recommend, suggest, and believe it's best to double check the other remaining solutions that we haven't looked at in order to confirm that B is the correct solution. So let's do that. We're looking at option C. 3, 1, 1, 2, 2, 4, 3, 4. The x value, 3, appears two times and maps to two different y values, which are 1 and 4. The conclusion here, this is not a function because an input maps to more than one output. Take a look at option D, 5, 6, 3, 9, 4, 12, 5, 9. The x value, 5, appears twice and maps to two different y values, 6 and 9. Again, the conclusion is that option D is not a function because an input maps to more than one output. Therefore, given these solutions, we know that the correct option is letter B. Let's move on. The next problem reads, a factory produces 25% of its daily output in six hours. If the factory continues to operate at the same rate, how many hours will it take to produce the entire daily output? Pause the video, try and work this problem, come back when you're ready. Alrighty, now let's remember to understand the problem. The factory produces 25% of its daily output in six hours. We need to find out how many hours it will take to produce 100% the entire daily output if the production rate remains consistent. So now it's time to set up the proportion. We know that 25% of the output takes six hours. We set up a proportion to find the time it takes to produce 100%. That's the hour goal. And now what we need to do is solve the proportion using the rule of cross multiplication and in order to find the letter X. Now it's time to confirm the calculation to make sure that our answer actually makes sense. Let's consider the rate of production. This means that the factory will take 24 hours to produce its entire daily output if it continues at the same rate of production. Understanding this, we know that the correct answer is D, 24 hours. 
All right, great. Moving on, the next problem reads, which equation illustrates the commutative property of addition? Pause the video and come back for the solution. Great. Now, before we talk about this problem, as you are preparing for your teacher certification exam, remember that you'll be expected to not only understand the commutative property of addition, but also the associative, the distributive, the identity, and the inverse property as well. This problem just happens to be about the commutative property, but I want to bring your awareness that your exam could have questions about all five of these different properties. And in case you would like a refresher lesson that teaches you all of the math properties in an easy to way understand geared towards passing your teacher certification exam, give yourself full access to the test prep at teacherpreps.com by clicking the blue button that reads get test prep now. So you can pass your teacher certification exam with ease. All right, let's jump back to the problem. Recall that the commutative property states that you can swap the order of the numbers being added without changing the sum. So let's analyze the options beginning with A. This equation swaps the order of A and B within the parentheses. This illustrates the commutative property because the sum inside the parentheses does not change regardless of the order of A and B. However, we want to double check B, C, and D just to make sure. So option B is incorrect as it suggests actually the distributive property. Option C represents the distributive property, not the commutative property. And then option D shows the associative property of multiplication, not the commutative property. Therefore, option A is correct. Moving on, this problem reads a right prism has a rectangular base with a length of 8 centimeters and a width of 6 centimeters. The height of the prism is 10 centimeters. Calculate the volume of the right prism. Take a moment, solve this problem, push play when you're ready. All right, let's talk about this. So first and foremost, let's define what a right prism is. Remember that a right prism is a three-dimensional shape with two parallel bases that are congruent polygons and the sides are rectangles. The height of the prism is perpendicular, is the perpendicular distance between the bases. So now for a quick review, remember the volume of a prism can be calculated using the formula volume equals base area times height. All right, now that we have a little refresher, let's begin by confirming the information that we've been given. Remember, always understand the problem and know what you have in the problem itself. And now let's calculate the area of the rectangular base. Remember that area equals length times width, which means in this case, the area is 48 centimeters squared. Now we need to calculate the volume of the prism, which we can see turns out to be 480 centimeters cubed. All right, great, let's keep going. Have a look at the diagram below, pause the video, read the question down below. If the lines K, L, and M, N are parallel to each other respectively, which of the following statements are true? Try and answer this, come back when you're ready to have discussion about it. All righty, first, congruent angles are equal in measure. So let's do a little review here. Remember that if two angles are congruent, it means their angle measurements are the same. Second, supplementary angles are two angles that add up to 180 degrees. These angles are often adjacent, but can also be separate. Third, corresponding angles occur when two lines are crossed by another line, and this is called the transversal. The corresponding angles are in matching corners, meaning one is on the top right of the first line and the other on the top right of the second line. And these are equal when the two lines are parallel. Finally, fourth, we have vertically opposite angles. These are angles opposite each other when two lines cross. 
they are always equal. Knowing this, let's go back to the original question. So what answer did you come up with? Here's what I see. Lines M and N are parallel. I also notice that angle G and angle R form a pair of corresponding angles. These angles are equal. I also see that angle G and angle W form a pair of vertically opposite angles. Therefore, angle G equals angle W. Moreover, angle W equals angle D as they form a corresponding pair of angles. Knowing this tells us that the correct response is letter A. All right, moving on. This question reads, which expression correctly represents the conversion of 15 meters to millimeters? Take a moment to answer this question. Come back when you're ready. All right, let's go over it. First, let's recall that there are 1,000 milliliters in one meter. Next, we need to set up the conversion for 15 meters. In order to convert meters to millimeters, we multiply the number of meters by the number of millimeters per meter. And since one meter equals 1,000 millimeters, for 15 meters, the conversion gives us 15,000 millimeters. And knowing this, we can see that the answer, 15 times 100 times 10, would be letter B. Here we have two cables are laid end to end. One cable measures 13 meters and 20 centimeters while the other measures 8 meters and 75 centimeters. What is the total length of the two cables? Try this question, come back when you're ready for the response. All right, great, let's talk about it. We need to understand first how to convert the measurements into meters. The first cable is 13 meters and 20 centimeters. 20 centimeters is 0 0.2 meters since 100 centimeters equals one meter. So the first cable's length in meters is 13.2 meters. Furthermore, the second cable is eight meters and 75 centimeters. 75 centimeters is 0 0.75 meters. So the second cable's length in meters is 8.75 meters. Now, to finish up, we need to add the two lengths of the two cables. Here we have 13.2 meters plus 8.75 meters, which is going to give us 21.95 meters, giving us the answer option of letter D. Moving on, a six-sided die numbered one through six is rolled three times, and each time the result is a three. What is the probability of rolling a three on the fourth roll? Pause the video, check your understanding and ability to answer, and come back for the solution. All right, let's talk. Taking stock into what we know about independent events we can remember, we can understand that a six-sided die has numbers one through six. Each are equally likely to occur on a single roll. Furthermore, the probability of rolling a three on any given roll is one out of six. You have a one out of six chance of rolling a three on every single roll that you make. And since each roll is independent, the outcome of previous rolls, for example, the information about rolling three threes in a row in the past does not influence the probability of rolling a three on the subsequent roll. So now it's time to analyze the problem. We are asked to find the probability of rolling a three on the fourth roll after already rolling three in the past, after already rolling three threes, because the die rolls in, are always independent. This means that the previous rolls do not change the probability of the fourth roll. So we need to calculate the probability for the fourth roll now. And keep in mind that the probability of rolling a three on a 
fair six-sided die is always going to be one out of six. And this remains true regardless of the amount of times the die has been rolled in the past or the out uh, the outcomes from the past. So with this being said, remember that on your teacher certification exam, you may receive problems that provide information that don't actually have use to you, such as the past performance of the other roles. So keep in mind, one of the most important things to understand is what the question is asking you and what information should you and what information should you not be using. So here the correct answer is one out of six. It's always a probability to roll a three. For example, you have one out of six chance. All right, moving to the next problem. A parking lot has 40 cars. Half of the cars are black and half are white. A customer drives away with a black car. If another customer randomly selects a car from the remaining cars, what is the probability that the car will be white? This is a great example of conditional probability. Pause the video here, solve this, and come back for the correct answer. Alrighty, let's talk. To solve this, we first want to identify the initial conditions. We know that the parking lot starts with 40 cars. We know that half of the cars are black and half of the cars are white. We also know that the number of black cars is 20. And the number of white cars is 20. Next, let's analyze the change in conditions. A customer drives away with one black car. This action reduces the total number of cars and the number of black cars. Remaining black cars is now 19. Remaining white cars is still 20. That's unchanged. The total remaining cars is 39. So for our next step, we want to calculate the probability of the next event by finding the probability that another customer selects a white car from the remaining cars. So keep this formula in mind. The probability of an event equals the number of favorable outcomes divided by that total number of possible outcomes, which here, the total is 39, as we just discussed. So for this case, this comes out to be 20 over 39. Is that what you got too? Excellent. Let's keep going. A school's math test scores for 10 students are as follows. 78, 85, 92, 57, 88, 90, 72, 96, 80, and 84. What is the range of these test scores? This is a useful statistical measurement problem that shows the difference between the highest and lowest scores. Try it out, come back when you have your response or just when you want the answer. All right, remember for your teacher certification exam that although this problem is asking for the range, you might be expected to demonstrate your ability to solve the mean, the median, the mode, and also the range. So just keep that in mind. Make sure that you have all of these math terms down and you are able to solve problems about them. Now, this problem is all about range, so let's go back to that. The range is the simplest measure of variability in data, and that it is calculated as the difference between the maximum and the minimum values in the data set. Now, in solving for this, the first thing you'll want to do on test day is to list the data. The math test scores for 10 students are as follows. Remember that 78, 85, 92, 57, 88, 90, 72, 96, 80, and 84. And furthermore, we're going to want to identify the maximum and the minimum scores. So first, identify the highest score in the data set. That's 96. Then the minimum, which is 57. Now it's time to calculate the range using the formula range equals maximum subtracted by or minus the minimum score. And here we can see that comes out to 39. Is that what you got? I hope so. If you're enjoying this video, please give it a thumbs up. I would totally appreciate that. Remember, this is coming from teacherpreps.com. Let's move on to the next problem. A part-time librarian works three days per week at a library that is open Monday through Saturday. If the workdays are randomly assigned, what is the probability that the librarian 
will work on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Give this problem a try and then come back to discuss it and see how it's solved. Excellent. Let's start. To work out this problem, we'll need to calculate the probability of specific events occurring within a set scenario, specifically focusing here on the selection of days that a librarian works at a library that is open and several multiple days a week. So our first step here is to define the total and desired outcomes. The library is open six days a week. That's Monday through Saturday. And the librarian works three days each week. And here we're interested in the probability that these days are Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So next, let's calculate the total ways to choose any three workdays. To do so, we'll use the combination formula to determine the total number of ways to choose three days out of six. That formula looks like this. Note, if it's been a while, the exclamation point in the formula rep represents a factorial, which is used to multiply a series of descending natural numbers down to one. So in this case, n is the total number of items to choose from, and k will be the number of items to choose. So plugging these numbers into the formula, you'll see that we get a number of 20, which means that there are 20 different ways the librarian can be scheduled to work any three days out of six. To complete this problem, we need to keep in mind that there is only one specific set of days that we are actually interested in, which is Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Therefore, this is one specific combination of days. So now we need to calculate the probability using the number of favorable outcomes divided by the total number of possible outcomes. And this gives us the answer of 1 over 20. Excellent. Moving on, the scores of 10 players in a basketball game are recorded as follows, 32, 21, 17, 32, 26, 17, 14, 21, 17, and 32. Select the expression that represents the median of the data provided. Pause the video here, folks. Try and complete this problem and come back when you're ready for the solution. All right, let's work this out. List the scores in ascending order. That's the first step that we have to do. Next, we need to determine the amount of data points that we have here. We have 10. And since there are 10 scores, which is an even number, we'll know that when we find the median, that will be the average of the two scores in the middle. So now it's time to identify those middle numbers. In this case, we have 21 and 21. Now, in order to calculate the median, we'll take those two numbers, 21 plus 21, divided by 2, which we can see the solution is 21, also written as option C, 21 plus 21, all over 2. Next question, if the pattern continues, what is the next term in the sequence? Solve this, come back when you're ready. All right. Now, in order to find the next term in the sequence, we'll want to analyze the numerators. And we'll be looking at these numerators 3, 7, 11, and 15. Calculate the differences between these consecutive numerators. And we'll see that the numerators increase by 4 each time. So now it's time to analyze the bottom part called the denominators. Let's look at the denominators 4, 8, 12, and 16. Calculate the differences between these consecutive denominators. And again, we notice that these increase by 4 each time. Now, we've found the pattern, and we can recognize that the next term in the sequence will be 19 over 20. Is that what you got, too? Great. All right, let's keep it moving. In a line of 36 classrooms, Every second classroom has red desks, and every fourth classroom after the second has green chalkboards. How many classrooms out of the 36 have both red desks and green chalkboards? To solve this problem, what are you thinking we should do? Take a moment here, 
See if you can find the answer. Come back when you're ready. All right, great. To determine how many classrooms have both red desks and green chalkboards, we can analyze the distribution of these features among the 36 classrooms. First, we'll want to identify the classrooms with red desks. And based on the information that was given, every second classroom has red desks. This means that the classrooms with red desks are classrooms 2, 4, 6, 8, and all the way to 36. Understanding this sequence, we can see the following. So we've got total classrooms of 18 because 2 times the variable n equals 36, where n is the number of classrooms. Next, we want to identify the classrooms with the green chalkboards. And according to the information provided, every fourth classroom after the second has green chalkboards. This pattern starts from classroom 2 and then adds 4 to each subsequent classroom from 2, 6, 10, 14, and all the way on to 34. And this forms the sequence where each term increases by 4, which helps us see that the total classrooms with green chalkboards is 9. Because starting from 2, adding 4 to each step all the way to 34 will provide us with the answer of 9. All right. And this forms the sequence where we can see that we are adding 4. And now it's time we need to find the common classrooms. So we have found the red desks, the green chalkboards. Now we need to find what's in common because the question that we're solving for reads, how many classrooms out of the 36 have both red desks and green chalkboards? In order to do this, we'll need to find the common elements in the two sequences. Again, red desks and green chalkboards. Common classrooms will have numbers that are multiples of both 2 and 4. Therefore, the common sequence here is going to be 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, 32, and 36. Knowing this, we'll count all of the terms that are like, meaning they have both the red desks and green chalkboards. These classrooms are those at every fourth position starting from four. So the total classrooms is nine, since we list out four, eight, 12, all the way to 36, which are nine terms. All right, excellent. Nine classrooms have both red desks and green chalkboards. Excellent. Moving on. That was the end of our math section. However, if you are feeling rusty and you want study guides, video lessons, practice tests in order to make sure you're totally prepped for test day, make it simple on yourself and go to teacherpreps.com. Click that blue button right at the top right corner labeled get test prep now.